I invite you to turn in your Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12, uh, we're going to be looking, um, starting in verse 13 and reading through the end of this chapter today. Once you find your place there, I want you to do um, something. Um, it's something I invited our ushers that are going to be serving the Lord's Supper today to do. Um, would you just, once you've got your place in the Bible, would you just look around and, uh, and see the faces that are in the room? Um, and it's not at all that everybody that sits in a church is a Christian. Um, if you're here and you're not a believer, not a follower of the Lord Jesus, thank you for sharing that time. This is special to us that you're here. But it is that many of the people in this room are believers. And uh, you're seeing the redeemed of God. Um, it's just a good little reminder to me when I'm preaching. Keep me reminded of who it is that I'm preaching to. And what a privilege it is to spend time with people that the Lord has redeemed from their sin. And that are his, his sons and his daughters. Um, good, good reminder as you look around, even as you leave uh, today in a little while, to look at the family God's blessed you with. Second Samuel. So if your usher when he's, he brings the Lord's Supper to you today, if he's, if he's looking at you and you think, stop being weird. He's, he's, thinking about, he's thinking about serving the redeemed of God, the very precious saints of the Lord. Um, and know that I look at you the same way. If you will, please stand with me. We're going to read beginning uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning verse 13. And we'll read down through the end of this chapter. And we stand because this is better than Jason's word. This is God's word. And it is perfect and beautiful. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against Yahweh. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. Woo. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife, don't miss that, that Uriah's wife bore to David. And it became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground. But he would not, nor did he eat food with them. Then on the seventh day, it came to pass that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. When David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. So David arose from the ground and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went to his own house. And when he had requested, they set food before him and he ate. His servant said to him, what is this you have done? You have fasted and wept for the child while he is alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept for I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and he went into her and lay with her. So she bore a son and he called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him. That is an amazing sentence right there. The Lord loved him. And he sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Uh, the name means beloved of the Lord. Now Joab fought against Rabbah of the people of Ammon and took the royal city. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah and have taken the city's water supply. Now therefore gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and it be called after my name. 
So David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah, fought against it and took it. Then he took their king's crown from his head. Its weight was a talent of gold with precious stones, and it was set on David's head. Also he brought out the spoil of the city in great abundance. And he brought out the people who were in it and put them to work with saws and iron picks and iron axes and made them cross over to the brickworks. So he did to all the cities of the people of Ammon. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. We want to talk today about lessons of correction, lessons of God's chastisement, and specifically about what repentance is. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, just to come back to you again and to to say thank you for the gift of your word, to say thank you for the gift of your spirit. Uh, Lord, that is my hope that today through your spirit, your word will be clear to us. And it will be clear to us for action, not just for knowledge. Would you please teach us and grow us? Would you please teach me and grow me? I've not outgrown the need to think about repentance. I've not outgrown the need for your fatherly chastisement, and none of us have. Lord, will you please help us to learn today? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Please be seated. We began uh, last week, uh, well, a couple of weeks ago, we began learning lessons about sin and hard lessons, hard lessons that I needed to hear. And we started last week really thinking through lessons of God's correction. Um, How many of you love being corrected? Nobody. Okay. Uh, But there are blessings and lessons in God's correction. Uh, And the Bible Bible frames it that way. Who does the Lord correct? Those whom He loves. loves. Not those whom He hates. Those He wants to destroy. He corrects those that He loves. He's treating them like sons and like daughters when He corrects us. It is a grace of God. And remember, we said that last week. If there are no consequences for sin, then there's no end of sin. It's just basic human nature. I got away with this. I can get away with this again. Or I can get away with more. That's human nature. Do you see that in yourself? Be honest. I do in me. If there are no consequences of sin, there is no end of sin. And God loves us enough to want to grow us. Uh, against in this fight against sin. So we've learned some lessons. I wanted to kind of recap a few of those from last week. Remember last week we learned a lesson about the greater sin. This whole section, chapter 11 and chapter 12, is just full of sin, and yet the passage saves one sin to the very end. And it's the one that receives the greatest penalty. It's the one we saw in verse 13 and 14. Giving the enemies of God occasion to blaspheme God. That's the greatest sin, greater than adultery, greater than murder. David has given opportunity to all the enemies of God to blaspheme him. That is one of the worst circumstances or consequences of our sin. And remember, we talked about the, the fact that our, our greatest mission in this world is, is not evangelism. Our greatest mission in this world is not discipleship. Our greatest mission in this world is the glory of God. It's why all of the heavens were created. The heavens declare what? The glory of God. That's what they're here for. And that's what we're here for, redeemed. Um, We we learned last week that the Lord Jesus, the first thing, the priority thing that he taught us about prayer was this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's that's our priority prayer. Again, the glory of God. God. How easy is it for us to fear sin simply because of the consequences on us? And yet how much more should we fear sin because of the the cost to the glory that God deserves in this world? Christians, remember this. We are ambassadors in this world. And what lost people around us know of God, they know from watching us. They're not going to read the Bible. They're not going to study Scripture. They're going to learn what they learn of God and His glory or lack thereof by watching us. And when we fall in sin, it it detracts from that greatest purpose of ours, giving glory to God. We also learned a lesson about praying for God's mercy last week. 
David hears from Nathan that God is going to strike this son, that the child is going to die, and in, in, instead of just relegating it to done, finished, that's over with, he begins to plead, to fast, to lay on the ground before God. For seven days he's pleading with God and fasting. Why does he do that? Does he not believe that God's going to do what God says he's going to do? Remember we, we learned that last time, sometimes God threatens so that he doesn't have to punish Mom and dad, you know what that's like? But we see why David did that in verse 22. He says, because I prayed anyway, because God's merciful. And who, there's our three, our three words, who can tell? Who can tell what God in his mercy might do? I might, in plumbing the depths of God's grace through prayer, I may find yet more mercy from God because that's who he is. And what a lesson that was for us, both in passion, in the passion and the hope of our prayer life. We have the most precious tool in this gift of prayer and one that we seldom use. What would God do if you ask? Who can tell? And sometimes we even fail at that point. Just asking God. God already knows. Yeah, but your father told you to do what? Ask, pray, seek. What would God do if you ask, Christian? What would God do if you persist in asking? Does God honor persistence in prayer? Yes, He teaches it to us and He honors it. What would God do if you plead with Him in prayer? Do you ever see anybody in Scripture pleading with God? Boy, Abraham knew how to plead with God. David shows us how to plead with God. What would God do if you plead with Him? What would God do if you fast? What would God do if you lay on the floor? Encourage you to seek the Lord in prayer and to plumb the depths of God's mercy through praying. We also then learned that lesson about accepting God's will. So here's, here's the question. In all of the pleading and praying and fasting and laying on the ground, did God give David his request? No. No. So remember that flip side of that notion of who can tell. I should pray because who can tell what God would do? But then the other side of that is who can, who can presume that God will do everything you want him to do? Nobody. David can't tell, so he prays. But he knows he can't presume upon God either. Um, some people will tell you if you pray with enough faith, you'll get everything that you want. Is that true? No. No. If it is in accordance with the will of God, you will get it. And if it's not, God, in, in other words, God is under no compulsion to answer your prayer. He wants you to pray. He wants you to persist. He wants you to fast. But he's under no obligation to answer that. He will do, do so according to his will. But we need to be seeking him. And so what does David do when God answers his prayer with a no? The Bible says he gets up. After seven days, he washes, he anoints himself, and he changes his clothes. And it's all about a change of focus. Because where does David go immediately? Not to taco shop. I've got it stuck in my head now, Asher. Where does he go? He goes to the house of the Lord to do what? Worship. What that whole picture is, is I, I am changing my focus now, and I'm going to go worship the God who has answered my prayer with a no. He has accepted God's will. David accepts God, God's providence, and he worships God. We talked last week about this, that there are some people who are no longer in fellowship with God or his church, even here, because God gave them a no to their prayer, maybe for a mother or a husband or a child. <coughs> And they have determined, I will not worship him anymore. And I just want to remind you, when we do that, we are judging God. We are judging God's providence. And in doing that, we are putting ourselves in the seat of God. And we don't belong there. What we belong is in this point of submission. Prayer, plumbing the depths of his mercy. And then when God answers, we worship we accept God's providence. I challenge us to, to recapture what I call the doggedness of saving faith. It's what we see in David here. David pleads 
And then David worships when he gets a no. That's, that's doggedness, persevering a love for the Lord. It's, it's what we found in Job as well. When Job says, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Uh, this, doesn't, this acceptance doesn't mean that David doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean that David doesn't wonder. It just means that he trusts God more than he hurts. And he trusts God with the things that he wonders. I encourage you, church family, if things are going poorly for you, uh, worship the Lord. Then today I want us to turn to consider some lessons about repentance. Um, still got this background of the, the consequences or the chastening or the correction of the Lord. But we begin to see some real um, detailed pictures of repentance here. And I want you to look first at verse 24. And 25, David comforted Bathsheba. And he, God says something odd here. What does he call Bathsheba? His wife. David's wife. It's odd because Bathsheba is seldom called Bathsheba in Scripture. Mostly she is called the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Chapter 11, verse 3. Chapter 11, verse 26. Chapter 12, verse 9. Chapter 12, verse 10. Chapter 12, verse 15. Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. It's like God wants to constantly remind David and us that this is another man's wife. He wants to remind us, highlighting, if you will, this notion of sin that David has committed. And yet for the first time here in that verse 24, she is referred to as David's wife. Every step of the way to get her to be his wife has been a step of sin. She is his wife by way of sin. It is wrong and God has made no bones about it. Now the question is, when there's consequences, chastisement from the Lord, what does repentance look like? What should they do? One option, they should divorce. Why would that not be a great option? It's been sin, 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 getting her to be his wife, and now what would divorce be? It would be adding more sin to the equation. And so the only picture that I had this week in thinking about that was this one. You can't unscramble the egg. Does that make sense? Uh, crack an egg into a bowl. I, I, have, I have a confession to you. I like to bake. There, there, I said it. I like to bake. You can ridicule me all you want, but it's delicious. Crack an egg into a bowl. What have you got? You've got a very distinct yellow surrounded by the clear egg in the bowl. They are together, but totally separate. Take the whisk to the bowl very quickly without thinking and run that around the bowl a few times. What have you got? You've got this solid, like homologous mixture of yellow and white. It's paler, white, paler yellow. And then you look over at the directions in the recipe and it says, now separate the yolk from the white. That is not going to happen. You know, go get, the micro, go get the microscope and the little bitty tweezers. You're not going to do it. And yet sometimes in our, in our sin, we, we come down to like this sin and we say, oh, David must unscramble the egg. No, there is no unscrambling of the egg. Divorce would be further sin. What David must do is repent. Not of the marriage but repent of the actions and attitudes that took him to the sin. He's got to repent and love her as his wife. Uh, the sin is not in having a wife, right? How many of you men have a wife? Amen. Amen. That's not a sin. The sin is in how he got her. And so the repentance there needs to be of the actions and attitudes that got him there. What David needs to repent of is he needs to repent of staying home when he should have been obeying God against the Ammonites. Remember we talked about the idle hands of the devil's workshop, right? A free time and a fallen heart usually leads to destruction and a mess. David needs to repent of his laziness. David needs to repent of glaring when he should have been turning away. David needs to repent of sending for another man's wife. David needs to repent of sexual immorality. 
David needs to repent of the pride that says, I can fix my mess. Isn't that what? David tried to unscramble the egg already, didn't he? He needs to repent of the pride that says, David can fix this. Some of you are right there right now. He needs to repent of murder. But to divorce her would have been additional sin. David needs to repent of the actions and attitudes and love Bathsheba as his wife. And listen, he does. And here's the amazing thing. We sang a song that talked about the scandal of grace. Here's the amazing thing. Does God bless that union? Yes. How does God bless that union? They, they have a son. And they named that son, son Solomon. Um, there's a, the consonants there are a well-known Hebrew word, shalomo. Shalomo was how the Hebrews would have said Solomon's name. What, what's the Hebrew word that you hear in shalomo? Shalom. shalom. Peace. Uh, so Solomon's name is his restoration or his peace. And then notice God's grace. He sends Nathan back to David. Boy, Nathan, he's been active, hasn't he? What an instrument of God's grace to, to go back and tell David about the house that God's building in him. What a grace of God for Nathan to go confront David lovingly with his sin. And what a, what a grace of God now that Nathan is sent by God back to say, I want to give you a nickname for a little scooter. We have the strangest nicknames for our kids, right? Well, in Virginia, by the way, if there's a kid born, they're going to call him Scooter, every one of them. Scooter. Have you ever, are there scooters in, in Kansas? I don't know if there's, I haven't met a single scooter in Kansas. They're all in Virginia. But he says, I have a nickname for this boy. It's Jedediah. Yah at the end of that. Jedediah means beloved of Yah, of Yahweh. What is God saying here? God's saying, I love this child. I love this child. If, if uh, David and Bathsheba were in a, a modern day soap opera, and boy, they have been, haven't they? It's been a soap opera. If, if they were in a modern day soap opera and this child is born out of wedlock in an ugly situation, that soap opera would give him the ugliest of little names for a child like that. And yet God sends back the prophet and says, I have named him beloved of Yahweh. There is a gospel picture there. Do you see that? How many of you are sons and daughters of sin? And I don't mean how your mom and dad conceived you. I mean that you were born in sin with a sin nature. That's all of us. And yet in the gospel, he has called us what? Sons and daughters, beloved sons and daughters. We're all Jedediah. Next week when you come to church, just walk through and go, hey, Jedediah, Jedediah. Well, people think we're crazy and they'll wonder what we're up to. But that's what the gospel has done for me. I am a son. The Bible says I am a child of God's wrath. His wrath abides on me because I have sinned. My very nature is twisted away from him. And yet in the gospel, Jesus, we're going to remember today, Jesus did what for my sin? He paid the penalty in the full, which means the penalty is death, separation from God. And Jesus has paid that. And the gospel now declares me Jedediah, beloved of Yahweh. What a, what a gospel picture there. God announces his covenant love for this child. And I just want to say, some of you are, are right where David and Bathsheba are maybe today. And you have sinned against God and you're feeling the, the heat of that and you wonder, am I, am I never going to be away from that? Am I always now relegated to be a second class citizen in the kingdom of heaven? And you look at this passage, verses 24 and 25, and you realize the answer by God's grace is, no, I'm not. One commentator said this, and I just, I just had to just cut it out and read it to you. Doesn't this text then give hope to any fallen believer? You are conscious of your failure, repentant of your sin, yet you have no ground in yourself to expect mercy, no reason to expect God's favor. You wonder if for the rest of your days you are doomed to exist within the confines of God's frown. 
Wow, what a way to put that. But if you have a true sense of grace, if you see God as David sees Him, you will walk in the light of hope. This passage doesn't mean to excuse your sin. This passage is here to help you get beyond the despair of your sin. Man, I needed that. Remember, we talked weeks ago about hesed, this, this word mercy in the Old Testament. We talked about the nature of hesed, of God's mercy, and one of the key components of it was commitment. God's mercy is tenacious. It doesn't let us go. Praise the Lord. And David is a picture of that. David has blown it. Has God let him go? No. Is he, is he going to chastise and correct and call is he going to press hard on him? Yes. But is he ever going to let go? Never. Praise the Lord. John 10, 27, Jesus speaks and says these words, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. By, by the way, just pause. What a description of a Christian right there. How do I know if I'm a Christian? Have you, have you heard his call? to come away from your old life and to follow Him instead? Uh, and, and, and do you follow Him? That's what He says. My sheep, the ones that belong to me, they hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Are you following Jesus? What a, what a test of our, of our Christianity, of our salvation. But Jesus says that and He says, and I give them eternal life and they shall, here's, here's a tenacious committed word, they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Just rest in the fact that if you are a follower of Jesus, he is committed in mercy to you. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. We saw that tenacity of, of, of God's committed mercy in Exodus 33 uh, this past Sunday night. The, the children of Israel, Moses has been on the mountain for way too long and the people are tired of waiting. They think he may be dead. And they say, Aaron, you're going to have to make us gods to go before us. And Aaron does it. And they sin. They break every commandment of God. Matter of fact, Moses comes down with the tablets written on by the finger of God. And he sees what the people have done and are doing. And he just takes them and he throws them down. And he shatters them. His picture of breaking all of God's commandments. And yet God looks at them and says, I have promised to give you the promised land. So rise and go. I will send my angel. And I have promised to drive out the inhabitants of that land. And I will. And I'm thinking, are you, what? You, you need to ditch them and start over with Moses. And God even tests Moses with that notion. And Moses says, oh, but God, your mercy is forever with your people. And it's to your glory that you would continue. And he just speaks truth back to God. And God says, that's right. That's what I needed to hear from you, Moses. That's what I wanted to hear from you. And yet God says, I'm committed to you in mercy. You bunch of golden calf worshiping rascals. Bunch of scooters. We learn this picture of repentance. The, the last thing that I, I want to point out here is just repentance in action. Um, we've talked about the need for David to turn from the actions and attitudes that brought him <clears throat> to this sin. We've talked about it, but do we see David repenting here? And I'm looking in this section of verse 26 through 31. We do see David in action, repenting against uh, from those things. David corrects himself. If you remember, what was the, when we looked at the small steps that lead to major sin, what was the first sin of David in chapter 11? He stayed when he should have gone. And the kings, were, God had already given him a command to go after the Ammonites. And it's time for the kings to go out and deal with us. Springtime has come. It's time to go deal with those things that God has told him about. And David says, no, no, no. Boys, you go. I'm going to hang out here. 
And in hanging out there, he's got a lot of free time on his hands. And he, he ends up, that's the first small step into sin. This last section here goes all the way back to that first little step and shows us how David is repenting. If, if one of the actions that led to his sin was laziness and being where he shouldn't be, God goes all the way back to that one and says, now watch, watch David change. Joab, he uses Joab in this, by the way. Joab is fighting against the Ammonites in place of David, and he sends messengers. Now remember, Joab's the one that David sent the letter to and said, hey, take your eye out on the front lines, put him in the fiercest part of the battle, and then abandon him there and make sure he dies. And Joab has carried that out. Joab knows what's going on back at the, back at the camp, back at the house. And now Joab's getting ready to take the Ammonite city, and he sends word back to David, and he, he, he kind of ribs him. David, I've already taken the water supply. This place is coming down. And if you don't come, what are they going to do? They're going to name this place after Joab. And listen, that's just a guy's way of saying, you better get your rear end down here. And he stirs David up. I, you can't get away from God's instrumentality here the instruments that God uses Nathan right Nathan go tell him his sin and here God's using Joab as this prod toward repentance Joab and he didn't say these words he just sovereignly used Joab this way Joab go and prod David to get off his rear and come out here and do what I called him to do and so David leaves the house. David leaves spiritual laziness and the temptation that it brings. And he goes out and does what he's supposed to do. And then we've got this picture of God's blessing again. God's blessing again. What's the blessing? God gives the Ammonites over to them. God gives the crown to David from the Ammonite king. God gives over the Ammonite people that God has judged. He gives them over to David. Again, God's showing blessing. In response to what? Repentance. Repentance. What, what a, a lesson of chastisement here. Listen, chastisement is not the penalty for your sin. Did you know that? The penalty for your sin is much worse than the chastisement. What's the penalty of your sin? Death. Separation from God forever. Who's taking care of that for us? The Lord Jesus will remember today His body and His blood. Why are we remembering body and blood? Because Jesus died for us. That's the penalty for our sin. Don't, don't get mixed up to think that the difficulty that comes from your sin is the penalty for your sin. That is this loving, gracious chastisement of a God waking you up to go away from sin. Chastisement is a wake-up call to repentance. A call to change direction in how you're living. And David is such a great picture of that in his faithful response. Even with that first small step towards sin. David gets it and now he changes his behavior. That helps me to reframe chastisement. And to frame it to match what God's Word says. Chastisement is a privilege that we have as children of God. It's a privilege. Again, where there are no consequences, there is no end to sin. It's a, a privilege. You will see people all around you, Christian, who don't have the chastisement of God. They sin freely and it doesn't bother them a bit. There is no weighing heavy-handedness of God on their heart. There's no brokenness. There's no remorse. There's no sense of, I shouldn't have done that and I should turn from that. They just sin happy and run on. Please listen, one day they will look up from hell and wish they knew the temporal, the earthly chastisement of God that David knew. They will look up from hell separated from God forever and wish that they went through the consequences and the weight that you feel when you sin against God. It is a privilege of God that children have, that His children have, that He would chastise us. And maybe this passage comes to you when you're right in the middle of chastisement. 
Maybe there's some secret sin that nobody else knows about and you're feeling the repercussions of it now. What do you do? Well, God would, would have you. And these are the actions from the passage. This is what we should do in response to this passage. God would have you realize the dark side of your sin and even the darkest side of your sin. Namely, that you are doing damage to the glory of God in this world by sinning. God would have you realize that His pressing on you is not a cause to run from Him, but to do what? To run to Him. Because He is a God of mercy. And above all, this is a call to stop the bleeding by turning from your sin and turning to righteousness today. Listen, if laziness is getting you in trouble of sin, if idle hands are the devil's workshop in your life, turn around from it. What do you do? Man, go do something fruitful for the Lord. Go, go get a job. Go, go do something. I think about my friends at Ellis County Jail, and, and I think about... Um, how if they're not careful in their time of incarceration, they're going to learn laziness. They, they, they have nothing to do. They watch the TV. They wait on the next meal. They, they play cards. They have nothing to do. And I, I, just, I warn them, don't, don't get used to this. You don't belong here. You do. I mean, there's a chastening that comes. But listen, this is not your home. And don't get comfortable being... Um, being docile and, 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 and empty and lazy. Get up from this place as soon as God would make a way for you and go get a job and go get active and go get in church and go serve the Lord. God calls you to stop bleeding by turning from your sin, even if it's laziness. And I would invite you to do that today. We, we can be so... I can be so hard-headed. I'm not even going to look at my wife when I say that. Where is she? I don't even know where she is. Probably. I feel her somewhere over here. But I, some heat coming. I can be so hard-headed. I can make my little steps to sin. And I can blow it. And I can reap the cost of it. And then go right back and repeat it again. Am I the only one? We can be so hard-headed. But the Bible shows us that we can actually repent as Christians. Dead people can't repent, but live people, people made alive by the gospel, by the gift of Jesus, they can repent. You have it in you. The Bible says he's given to us all things for life and godliness, already given it to us in Christ. We can repent and we can make a different choice. Chastisement is a grace. The goodness of God. Any thoughts or other applications or lessons that you see in Bathsheba and in David that you'd share with us? Any thoughts?